So let's go and talk about kind of the three Pomora agents currently on the market. Methyl naltrexone being uh, the oldest and has been around the longest, uh, but then also naloxagol, which is Novantic, approved in 2014, and then most recently uh, naldemidine, approved in 2017. Um, Jeff, walk us through a little bit about uh, naldemidine and the, the trial data for that. Okay, so uh, the naldemidine uh, trial, there was the uh, Compose 1 and the Compose 2 trial where they were compared against, um, against placebo. And the Compose 1 trial was 68, um, 68 sites in seven different countries. And the Compose 2 trial was 69 sites at, I think, um, six, six countries. Um, and and the, the outcomes they looked at, actually, not only for the naldemidine trials, but for all the trials, were very similar. They were three, three or more spontaneous bowel movements. Uh, they, they, you know, they involved um, looking at straining um, and, and all the things that we discussed that are part of the Rome 4 criteria. Um, and, and the FDA, of course, looks at this when you want to bring these drugs to the market. What are the most reasonable things to look look for and look, look at the outcomes. And, and all three of these drugs uh, work very well. They, they all work uh, similarly well, but there are differences among the three of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Brett, tell me a little bit about your experience with uh, naloxagol. Um, I pushed for an oral from uh, being in the outpatient setting and now in the inpatient setting, but I've really pushed for oral. Um, there were, there's been stigmas about shots in the outpatient setting a lot of times, and so uh, naloxagol was the first oral that came to market. Problematic, uh, worked, did its job, and again, how brilliant that is that the chemist created a product that can do what it does, but it's metabolized by the CYP450 pathway, and so we know we have significant drug-drug interactions potentially with that. We know a lot of patients take a lot of medications that potentially you know, uh, coexist among the CYP pathway, but nonetheless, we have that issue there. We also really have a narrow prescribing indication, initially chronic non-cancer pain, and you can help me out with the second. They came out with a newer indication. Basically, it had to do with cancer pain, but five years post-cancer, and their opioid dose had era. to be yeah. um, stable. So somebody else could help me out with yeah, that. So the that whole, yeah, so the whole idea with that was when the FDA changed the labeling, um, the idea is to not preclude patients who have chronic pain that had cancer, um, it, it, as long as they're stable. So when you do these studies, the studies were not done in cancer patients, and the reason for that is because there would be fluctuation in their opioid dose. And so the FDA changed the labeling such that the patient could have had cancer, um, but that they're stable now. When you think about how many more cancer survivors there are now, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. These patients have ongoing pain even after a cure um, because of the chemotherapy itself, because of the disease, because of surgery, or because of combination of any right. one or more of those three. Mm -hmm. um, and I also would like to um, uh, talk about something you brought up was the SIP metabolism. That's really important in distinguishing among the three different Pomoros. So if, if we go through them, um, starting with um, naloxagol, so naloxagol um, is metabolized by CYP3A4. It's a substrate. And it also depends on peak glycoprotein for absorption. So there are potential drug interactions. If you take another drug that induces CYP3A4, then the area in the curve goes down. And if you give an inhibitor, then the area in the curve goes, goes up. Um, and so because of that reason, um, the, the package insert for naloxagol states that if you're on a strong inhibitor, that it's contraindicated. Moderate, um, you know, you, could, you can adjust the dose down from 25 milligrams to 12 and a half. If we're talking about uh, naldemidine, uh, naldemidine is also 3A4 and peak glycoprotein uh, substrate, uh, but the, the, the package insert does not require an adjustment, it's just a warning. And then uh, we have uh, methyl naltrexone. Methyl naltrexone is different than the other two because methyl naltrexone depends on CYP2D6 as a substrate. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there's no evidence to suggest that it relies on peak lycoprotein, and it's also a weak inhibitor of 2D6. But there are, the studies that have been done have shown no influence on the area end of the curve with naldemidine 
with regard to lowering or raising the levels, and therefore there's nothing in the package insert about dosing adjustments, with one exception. And that is that if you take a, a food that's a high, highly fat, fat, fatty food, uh, then it can, then it can um, decrease the absorption by, by 50%, all right? And because of that, um, because of that, uh, the suggestion is that you take it a half an hour before meals. But one thing that always, always kind of intrigued me is that I'm not sure what happens with the area of the curve. If we're talking about their activity on, on receptors in the gut and the serum levels go up or down, I can't, I can't reconcile my mind if that will be better or worse. If there's more drug in the gut, it, 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 would that be helpful? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. It's not been studied.